every breath that I am able. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Um, thank you for, for having me here tonight. Um, thank you, Brian and Roisin, for taking care of me and having me in your house and uh, loving on me and uh, just pampering me, right? It's like you, you can sit in their house and you feel like you're in the Godhead, right? Where you're just being pampered with love, right? Because that's what happens in the Godhead. It's just a pampering of love with one another, right? The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. The Spirit loves the Son. The Spirit loves the Father. The Father loves the Spirit. And it's just like this dynamic flow of love that's never ending. It's like perpetual motion, right? And the reason why I asked you to play that song for me, and I say this a lot, and so if you've heard me say this at my own church, you just have to bear with me um, because it's just as powerful to me now as it, it was then. But... Um, I was filled with the Holy Spirit when I was three years old. The, my mother had a radical salvation experience, if you want to call it that, like massive deliverance. Like, um, didn't know who she was, didn't know where she was, was probably clinically insane, would have massive hive outbreaks to where you couldn't see who she was. And she got just set free one day, like, bam, by the Lord. And uh, so you can imagine, I mean, it says, he who is forgiven much loves much. Well, you can imagine the deliverance my mom experienced. She would walk around the house all day long. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I'm like a three-year-old boy. That's what my mom's doing all day, right? Weeping. Praise the Lord. And uh, I said, Mama first, then Dada. And then it was, Pray the Lord. Pray the Lord. Pray the Lord. Um, when I was six years old, that word you just gave before, that God would touch my mouth. Um, when I was six years old, I was in a charismatic meeting. We were in the Catholic Church when I was a little boy, and the priest had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And the priest started holding meetings, right, Wednesday night after hours, right, and having everybody in. And uh, I remember listening to everybody talking about God, and they would get up and give words. And I was a little bitty boy. I think I was like six years old, and I was flipping through my Bible. And I was like, give me something to say to these people, Lord. Give me something to say. And uh, a guy stood up in that meeting and he, he, he prophesied over me, and he prophesied Jeremiah 1. He said, God has put forth his hand and touched your mouth to pull down, to tear up, to destroy, to build, and to plant, Amen. right? And I had completely forgot about that because you go on in life, and I went through hard times in life. Like, I went through hard times. I was addicted to drugs for, like, 12 years. I died on a hospital bed, overdosed on drugs, had to be shocked back to life, like, nine times. So it wasn't just, like, this immaculate existence, Pain, suffering, confusion, darkness. Where is God now? Those kinds of things. And uh, after we started the church for, for a couple years, I was in the, the mirror shaving my head, you know. Uh, we have a double-sided mirror, and I'm just shaving my head. You know, God can become so tangible to you that, honestly, I can touch God. You might think that sounds crazy, but I can touch God. Like, I'm talking with God out, out, out loud all of the time, Right? Um, and so I'm in the bathroom talking with God, you know, about my hair. That particular day, I was telling God, I don't think I want my hair back in the glorified earth, right? I don't, I never liked my hair. Can I just have it like this? And he's telling me, you'll like your hair no matter what it looks like, I promise you. I was like, okay, that's, that's okay. As Brian would say, that's okay. I like that saying. I'm going to take that back with me. I'm going to take a piece of all of you back with me because my time with you has been so enriching to me. Right? I hope you know that I, I didn't just come here to give you something. I came here to fellowship with all of you around the love of God, right? that we might be edified by one another and by our time together. And so I'm taking something home with me from all of you, and it's going to be a great blessing. And I just pray that I've been able to impart something as beautiful as, as you've imparted to me. But anyway, I was shaving my head in the mirror and I completely for forgot about that word. I for completely forgot about God and me asking God, just give me something to say to these people. And I was shaving my head, and all of a sudden I heard God say, do you think I gave you something to say? And my eyes got big, and I nearly fell over weeping because I completely forgot about that. 
right? And it's, you, these things come and go. People say things to you. People speak words, and they come and they go, and you forget. You're walking in a world. Things happen, right? And, and, and circumstances change, and life happens to you. How many of you have had life happen to you, right? How many of you asked for it to happen to you? I don't think anybody. It just happens to you, doesn't it, right? It just happens to you. But it was a powerful thing when he said that. Do you think I showed you something, Greg? But the all my life you have been faithful, right? I was close with God in my life, and then trauma comes, and then the world is able to convince you that God isn't there, right? Because you don't know nothing yet about God to discern what's happened. You just know something happened, and it's horrible, and you, you grow up with this idea. I don't know if you guys realize it, but we, we subconsciously believe that if God is present there, life must be present there. And if we think life isn't present there, we immediately think it means God's not present there because we inherently know there's no darkness in God. There's only light and life in God. And so if he was there, how could this trauma also be there, right? And if you don't understand the gospel, if you hadn't been taught yet, if you hadn't matured in the love of God, you could become very confused when life happens to you. And there was a long period of time in my life where I was very confused. And I'm just going to be transparent with you guys because I'm not trying to get you to, to feel good about me, right? Or to think that I'm super spiritual or super holy or something like that. There's a long period of time in my life where I knew the right answer was that God has always been faithful. Like if somebody gave me the test, I could fill it out. But if somebody could come and expose the inner workings of my heart, and if someone could come and expose the deepest fears and hurts and insecurities in my heart, do you know what they would find? I did not always believe God was faithful. And you know why? Because I had all this evidence that suggested otherwise. Right? So in my head, I would say that's the correct answer. That's what the Bible says. Right? And then, then we come to the place where we try to feel super spiritual. We try to make ourselves feel better about knowing, and we come up with these fancy sayings, well, no one can know. That's a lie. Jesus came in the flesh, God in the flesh, so that we can know. And those are the kinds of things we say when we don't know and we're trying to make ourselves feel better for not knowing. And it's okay that we said that. But we ought not condemn ourselves to the place where we think we're going to live all of our days in this world looking through a glass darkly lit. Because that ain't what that scripture says. That scripture does not say that we're condemned to looking through a glass darkly lit. In fact, if you go to 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says that we now with unveiled face... Behold the glory of the Lord in the face of Jesus, and we behold ourselves in his face. So we're no longer looking through a glass darkly lit. We understand very clearly that God is faithful because God has come and revealed his faithfulness to us in the person of Jesus. You see, and I realized the reason why I struggled to believe that God was faithful, that all my life you have been faithful. I want to cry like a baby every time I hear that because it, it takes me back over my life. And it reminds me how faithful God was to me. Because listen, outwardly, I would have never said anything negative about God. But inside of my heart, when I was going through life, thinking that he failed me, that he wasn't there for me, that he wasn't faithful, I did not have pleasant conversations with God. And I promise you, I nailed him to a tree weekly in my heart. And he kept pursuing me. He didn't despise me. He wasn't angry with me. He understood how I could feel that way. Because you know what? He understands that life can happen to all of us. And he understands the life that's happened to all of us in this earth. Well, listen, man, the life that's been planted in this earth from Adam is not God's life. And the life that happens to us in this earth many times has come forth from death. And he understands what that can do to us and how it can war on our souls and how it can swirl around us like darkness and confusion. He doesn't despise you if you've ever been confused about whether or not he's faithful. He doesn't despise you if you've ever been confused about whether or not he loves you. He doesn't despise you if you've ever found yourself in the place where you said, where is God now? Right? And see, something God started showing me, the reason why I can easily say, all those bad things still happened in my life. The reason why I can easily say, all my life God has been faithful, is because, just like that song says, what a beautiful name it is. God silenced the boast of sin in the grave. That's not just a cliche. And that's not just like, oh, that's a nice lyric. How poetic, how smart of them to write that down. You know, in the body of Christ, we get into judging each other, right? 
We judge different churches. We judge whether or not they're, they're really preaching the gospel or whether they're faithful. I don't care what anybody says about Bethel. Their gift might not be doctrine or theology, but that song is from the Holy Spirit, right? And I rather appreciate the gift that they do have instead of condemning them for the gift they don't have. Right? Because not every person could be a hand, a foot, a mouth, an arm, a stomach, a leg, a toe, and you're not supposed to be. That's why we need the whole body. We're supposed to come together and not judge ourselves amongst ourselves. If their gift isn't doctrine, if maybe they're not a mouth, maybe I'm a mouth, right? And maybe they need me, right? And I'll be the mouth from the south, okay? Because I'm from Louisiana, deep down south, right? And we can bring in their gift to give song, prophetic psalms. But he silenced the boast of sin in the grave. Guys, I don't think we realize it, but when Satan planted death in the earth, that death began to accuse God. And it began to accuse God to all of us, right? Because after all, if God really loves us, if he's really a good father, if he's really as he ought to be as the lover of our lives, then how could these things happen? And Satan didn't even just accuse God that way. He actually created something in the earth where he got all of us blaming God for the death that manifested in the earth. We even write it into our insurance policies in Louisiana. Do you know what we call I mean, we have hurricanes there. And do you know what it's written into the policy as? An act of God. We've said it so much, we've thought it so much, we don't even think about it. You see, what happened is we've been looking for the testimony of whether or not God's faithful by the life we see in this earth. But that ain't where you find the testimony of whether or not God's faithful. Jesus is the word made flesh. It says he's the word made flesh. And so what that means is, is he's the word made flesh about everything, everywhere. And he's the only word you look at to determine anything about God. Because it says in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God face to face with God, and the word was God. Do you know what that means? Jesus is the only place you look to to find any truth or any word about God. Jesus is the testimony of God. And so when I start looking for the evidence of whether or not God is faithful, and if I look in this world to the death Adam planet, it will always tell me he's not faithful. And that's really the temptation common to human beings. It's a temptation common to every human being. Our temptation is to uh, not believe in the love of God, not to believe that God is really with us to be the father we need. That's the temptation common to every human being. And the way Satan tempts us is he uses the death in this world. And he comes and points at the death and he says, where's your God now? And he's tempting us to not believe. And the reason why he's tempting us not to believe, the reason why he comes to accuse God in our hearts is because he's trying to get us to use our own strength to gather life to ourselves. He's trying to get us to fornicate with our own works to be fruitful. He's trying to get us to till our dying bodies, trying to produce the fruit of God's life, right? He's trying to give birth to his life inside of us. Well, if we really believe God's a good father, if we really believe that he's as he ought to be as father, if we really believe that all our days he has been faithful, if we really believe he could never hide his face from us, that he could never reject us, if we really believe that, then we would never try to gather life to ourselves. Even should we find ourselves dead in sin, we would never try to clothe ourselves with life. Do you know what we would say? Abba, into your hands I commit my life. The moment we didn't feel we had joy, the first thing we would say is, Abba, serve me with joy. The moment we didn't feel love or acceptance, we wouldn't try and gain it from the world. We would say, Abba, I need love and acceptance. The moment we needed peace, we wouldn't try to gather peace to ourselves. We would call out to him to serve us with peace. You see, Satan wants to convince us that God isn't there, that he isn't faithful. The reason he wants to do that is because then we start looking to our own hand, the works of man's hand. And then we try to use our own hand to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Do you know what happens when you try to produce the fruit of the Spirit through your own strength? You can't. And not, it's not that you won't produce anything. Do you know what will come out of you if you try to bring forth life out of yourself, not out of union with God? You're going to bring forth the fruit of death. And so how did God silence the boast of sin in the grave? What was... Sin in the grave saying about God, he isn't faithful. Where is he? 
Where is he? If you're really his children, let him come for you. And then what do we see in Jesus? He comes out of the grave clothed in the glorious immortality of God himself, having conquered sin and death in the flesh. And then it doesn't stop there because you realize, wait a second, that's the light that was from the beginning. You see him come out of the grave. Then you realize he must be God. Then you realize that's God himself on the cross taking your sin and death into himself, that God was not willing to impute your sin to you, that when God thought about the wages of your sin, which is death, we earn death by our own works. God never thought we deserved death because God never reasoned from the place of our works. God decided what we were worthy of before we ever did anything. That's what the scripture says about Jacob and Esau, that God chose Jacob before he could do anything. God decided that Adam was worthy of his life and his love after he made Adam when he got down on one knee and blessed Adam. And so when we were dying, because we heaped death upon ourselves by looking to our own strength, isn't that what the first man Adam did? Didn't he try to clothe himself? He didn't cry out to God. He got busy trying to clothe himself in fig leaves. So when man heaped death upon themselves by their own strength, God saw that we earn that with our own works, but he was not willing to impute our sin to us. And then Abraham says something fantastical. God will provide himself a lamb. God didn't ask for a lamb from you, which is what makes God different than every other God that this world has ever created. You notice the gods in this world demand sacrifice and offerings from you? Have you ever noticed that? Even in Christianity, we've dwelt in so much confusion. We think God demanded sacrifices and offerings and gifts from us. Well, the psalmist records Jesus reading in Psalm 40 that my eyes have been opened. Lo, sacrifices and offerings you never desired, but a body you have prepared for me. And so God provided the sacrifice, and the sacrifice is himself. I will provide myself a lamb because I'm not willing to let my people die. Neither am I willing to live without them. So I'm going to enter into the earth in the place where they think I'm not faithful. I'm going to enter into the earth in the place where they think I've abandoned them, where they think I've left them, and the death and the darkness is accusing me to them, and they think that I'm not here with them. I'm going to enter right into the midst of all their sin and all their death and all their pain and all their hurt and all their darkness, and I'm going to absorb it into myself. And then I'm going to take it down into the grave. And then I'm going to leave sin and death down in the grave. And I'm going to deal a death blow to sin and death. And I'm going to come out of the grave free from sin and death, clothed in glorified immortal flesh. And I'm going to come out of the grave and offer that life to my people. And there's going to be God right in our midst. And then we're all going to see how faithful he is. Try and find somebody willing to lay down their life for you. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. I think you guys like me. I feel well, well received in Ireland, and please don't take this the wrong way, but if, I don't think any of you are going to beat down the door to lay down your life for mine. Maybe the Holy Spirit might move you to, right? What did Paul say? Somebody might lay down their life for a righteous person, right? Maybe Kyle. Where's Kyle? Is Kyle back there somewhere? He keeps saying, I can't let you die, man. Maybe Kyle would lay down his life for mine because he's, con- con- he's convinced I have to keep preaching, Right? But God, and he did it while we were ungodly, it says. Do you think he did that to try to prove something to us? In the place where he thought, he, that we thought he had left us and rejected us, here he comes in the midst of our sin and our death. He found us dead in sin, and he did that. Right? Jesus is the testimony about whether or not God is faithful, and we look all over the place, and we're looking in the wrong places. Right? We're looking in the world to find the evidence of whether or not God's faithful. But Jesus is the word about whether or not God's faithful. And we see in the face of Jesus that God rather take our death into himself than let us die. We see in the face of Jesus that God conquered death in the flesh, which is the thing that was tormenting our lives. He overcame it in the body of Jesus' resurrection. And that issues a verdict or a decree in the earth, which is that God is faithful. You can trust him with your life. Isn't that what we see Jesus did? Didn't he demonstrate that to us? Does that make any sense? You guys following that? I went into all that. Um, 
Because normally, when during praise and worship, I'll get a word for somebody. But I got a, a word. I was praying before um, the the meeting, and um, in the bedroom, and I was getting tired because I'm tired. Kyle took me on this hike. It's like straight up, <laughs> right? Well, when I lived in Colorado for a while, that would have been fine. But I live in New Orleans now. We're under sea level, <laughs> and it's flat. You know what I'm saying? It was a nice hike, but it, it kind of took a toll on me by the time I got home. So I'm praying, and I'm falling asleep. And I got, this image of, for, I got this image of somebody, and they were, like, feverishly walking around looking under things. Like, you ever lost something in, in your house, and you're walking around looking for it? For me, it's always my wallet. My sweet wife is like, we got to do something. Like, every time I'm, where's my wallet? Where is it at? And I'm, I'm looking everywhere. It takes 10 minutes to find it. Well, there was somebody in this, in this image, there was somebody walking around, look, flipping up, turning books over, looking under newspapers, looking under bowls. They were moving from room to room, and they were just frantically like moving stuff around and looking for something. And all of a sudden, I felt like the Holy Spirit just said that um, they're looking for me. And they, they don't think that they, they're wondering where I am. Why can't they find me? And that... It, it turned into not only are they looking for me and thinking they can't find me and that I'm not there, but they were all, it turned into them thinking that they can't hear God. And they were, it's like they were feverishly looking for God because they're so convinced that they can't hear God, right? And it, it was starting to torment them that they thought they couldn't hear God. And so I just had this image of someone that's looking for God, and I just want that person to know, whoever it is, that God has drawn near to you, Right? You don't need to look for God. He's there with you. You can just start talking to him, Amen. right? And I just heard him say that the, the idea that you haven't heard him is ridiculous because the reason why you're even looking for him is because you heard him. <laughs> I mean, we don't look for God on our own, right? He calls out to us and we start looking. Right? And so whoever that is in here, man, if you think you haven't heard God, you've heard God. You're in this room, aren't you? Right? Well, how do you think you got here? What do you think brought you here? Right? I mean, we, we, we get so super spiritual and did I hear God? Well, maybe you haven't heard a voice that sounded like, thus saith the Lord, and all these super spiritual things, right? Which you can get a word like that. Someone can quote the verse. But when it's just inside of your heart in a personal relationship, it's much more simpler than that many times, right? It's just God drawing you somewhere, right? Come be in this meeting. Come be part of a body. Come be part of a fellowship. Come gather with the people of God. Come rejoice in God with people, right? Let the Spirit be released, and you will start being ministered to more and more and more. And what I want to say is it's a lie that you don't hear God. And it's a lie that God's not there with you, and you've got to look for Him. And God wants you to know you're looking in the wrong place. You're... You, it, all those things you were looking under, it, it's like you were looking in the world for the evidence of God. And I don't say God can't test, God isn't testified in creation. The scripture says that he is. But what God has done, God has spoken through Jesus. The cross and the resurrection of Jesus is God talking. And that's what God is trying to say to you. He's trying to talk to you about that. And you're looking for him in all these circumstances and all these things. And you want to know if he's in your circumstances or not. Well, he entered into your circumstances on the cross, yeah. right? And then he overcame your circumstances in the resurrection. And he's trying to speak to you about that, right? And sometimes God can be talking a whole lot. But, and you don't think you hear him because you're looking somewhere else for his voice, right? And so I don't know who that is, but whoever you are, man, you're hearing God a lot, right? You don't look feverishly for God if you ain't heard him. In fact, it's almost like you hear the voice, and so you've you, 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 you got to believe it's here or it's there, right? Glory to God. You guys bear with me while I open this up and see what we're going to talk about tonight. You preach so many messages, they all start running together. Right. Um, I think this is maybe the last message I'll preach here. And then um, Saturday I'll go to Derry um, River City Church. Is that what it's River City Church? Fellum and Nicola Doherty um, Sunday morning and Sunday evening. I'll preach there. Um, then um, 
I think that's it. And then I go to Holland and I'll preach there. So just thankful for the time we have together. You guys bear with me. The temptation common to man. You know, one of the reasons why we're so easily tempted, I can't move off of this. One of the reasons why we're so easily tempted is because we don't even know what temptation is. We don't even know how the devil tempts us, right? The Apostle Paul said that we're no longer beguiled or deceived by Satan because we understand what he does. Well, if I'm being honest, when I walk through the body of Christ, I find very few people understand how Satan tempts us. We call it the temptation common to man. We say Jesus was tempted in every way we were tempted, but then we come and define temptation by like, impure thoughts towards women. And we say that's how he tempts us. That makes sense to us, doesn't it? I mean, if all of you are just being honest in here right now, you'd be like, yeah, doesn't that sound right? Well, Jesus said if you had an impure thought about a woman, you've already laid with her. So does that mean Jesus laid with the woman because he has been tempted every which way we've been tempted? And if temptation is for us to have an impure thought about a woman and he's been tempted every way we've been tempted, then he must have had an impure thought about a woman. But then that would make Jesus a sinner. And we all know he's not a sinner. And we don't even consider these things. Listen, having impure thoughts about a woman, drunkenness, drug addiction, uh, hatred, all those types of things, that's the fruit that comes forth in you after you've already succumbed to the temptation. That's called the works of the flesh. The temptation that comes against us from Satan is with the intent to get us to look to our own strength to try to produce the fruit of God's life. And do you know how he tempts us? He tempts us with death. He comes and points at the things in our life that are crooked. And he tries to get us to make them straight ourselves. And the way he tries to get us to make them straight is he comes and tells us, where's your God now? Because if you don't think God's there to make it straight, you're going to try to make it straight. And if you try to make it straight, do you know what's then going to come out of you? Impure thoughts, drunkenness, addiction. For myself, I was so tormented in my heart because of trauma that I didn't know enough to call upon God and ask him for peace. So I began trying to give myself peace. I thought I was left to give myself peace. After all, the devil convinced me God wasn't there with me. And if God ain't there, then I got to give myself peace. And do you know what happened when I started trying to give myself peace? Do you know what the result was? Drug addiction. Because that's how man tries to give themselves peace. Right? How did Satan tempt Jesus when he was on the cross? Where's your God now? Let him come for you if he'll have you. Come down off the cross. You see what he's trying to get Jesus to do? Prove you're the son of God. Come down off the cross. And what was he using to tempt Jesus with? The body of death. Well, that's the same thing that happened to the first man, Adam. You know, the first man, Adam, was also naked. And what did he try to do? He tried to clothe himself, didn't he? And why did he try to clothe himself? Because he thought God wouldn't clothe him. It says he was ashamed and afraid. And that he was hiding from God. And so that's what Satan tries to tempt us with. He, co- he got death into the earth. And he uses that death to come and speak silent words to us. If he really loves you, where is he? If he's really your father, how could this happen? Let him come for you if he'll have you. Right. And all that while he's tempting you to believe God isn't there and he's tempting you to believe God doesn't love you. He's tempting you to believe that God is not a good father. He's tempting you to believe that you can't trust him with your life. He's tempting you to believe that you need to take up your own life. He's tempting you to believe that you need to care for yourself, that you got to take the burden of your life onto yourself. He's tempting you to take thought of your own life so that you're no longer living like a little child, right? Looking to the Father for life. Isn't that what Jesus said? Take no thought for your own life. Which of you can add one cubit of stature to your life? And then he goes into, has not your Father in heaven? Aren't you not much more precious than these birds and these lilies? Has your father not cared for them and clothed them? Seek ye God's righteousness towards you, and all these things will be added unto you. That's the temptation common to man. He's trying to get us to no longer live as little children. He's trying to steal our innocence from us. Do you know how little children live? Little children live not carrying the burdens of this world not carrying the cares of this life, 
They're free from all that. They don't even know anything's wrong. They're just running around. La, 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 la. I grew up watching the Smurfs. Forgive me. They just, little kids walking around Smurfing, right? Not a care in the world. Do you know why? Because they have no concept that they need to be concerned for their life. Because they have two parents caring for their life. Someone else is carrying the burden of their life. So they're free to just live free from the burdens and the cares of this world. And what do we say the moment a little child loses a parent or ha doesn't have a parent? We say their innocence was stolen from them. Yeah. And why do we say that? Because now the burdens and cares of this life have been thrust upon them at an age we say is too early. That's the same thing God says about us. When death entered the earth and we began carrying the burden of trying to produce life ourselves and Satan's trying to convince us to take up our own life, to carry the burden of bringing forth life ourselves and the thing he uses to try to convince us to do that is the trauma and the tribulation in this earth. And then he points at those things and says, where's God now? Jesus is the word made flesh about the temptation common to man. And you have to define what temptation is by looking at how Satan was tempting Jesus on the cross. Because when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, it says he left him till a more opportune time. Yeah. Do you know when the more opportune time was? The cross, when he was going to be stripped naked and he was going to be mocked and spit on and a crown of thorns was going to be pressed in his head and he was going to be flogged to death. and He was going to be made to carry a cross and then he was going to be nailed to the cross. Jesus said that the Pharisees were of their father, the devil. Well, there was the devil at the cross saying, where's your God now? I just feel I gotta blow up some theology. I'm so sorry. I say that so you realize that I'm really kind. I said that last time. I don't mean to upset anybody when I come tearing up your theology. I really don't. I say it because the name of God has been blasphemed in the earth. And if the name of God is blasphemed in the earth, it makes it impossible for people to really trust him. They want to trust him, but they don't find the strength to trust him. You can't actually produce trust in your own heart. God's the one who produces trust. Trust comes forth when you behold something that you believe is full of integrity and honor. And when you see the integrity in somebody's heart, you trust them, right? Well, we've said things about God that makes it nearly impossible for a human to trust God, right? Where's your God now? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, for years, I read that verse and thought Jesus was just saying it out of the blue because he hurt so bad. And my theology and the people who taught me theology in the Bible college I went to told me that God had to forsake the son in order to accept me. Right. We do. We sing it. We sing songs about it. And we think we're real spiritual because we're judging ourselves and God's heart for us by our sin-stained conscience. Jesus didn't say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me out of the blue? He didn't just dream it up out of the blue. In fact, he said it in response to the Pharisee saying, where's your God now? He said it in response to the Pharisee saying that God had forsaken him. If you really are the son, where's God now? Let him come for you if he'll have you. That's what they were saying to Jesus, effectively telling Jesus that he was forsaken by God. And Jesus responds by quoting Psalm 22, which begins with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know what happens when you get down to verse 24 of Psalm 22? Do you know what the psalmist says? You have not abhorred the affliction of the afflicted one, neither is your face hid from him, but you hear him when he cries out to you. And then we all know Jesus cried out, Abba, on the cross, didn't he? Yeah. Paul come and said, we have not been given the spirit of fear. We have been given the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. Well, what spirit did Jesus have on the cross? What did he cry out? Abba, Father. And do you know how he cried out, Abba, Father? Because the spirit and the father were in him. That was father, son, and spirit working to save their people. You know, something interesting about Hebrew guys, you know, we've broken all the scriptures up verse by verse. The Bible was never written like that back then. They didn't break up the verses. The chapters ran together. You wouldn't even have chapters many times in the ancient script. Now, listen, I kind of like the chapter and verse because it makes it easy to search. 
That's why we put it. But something I've noticed about our minds, we read one verse and then we close the book. And we think the next verse is a completely different thought. And we chop up all these different verses, right? And we never see the full context of what's being said there. But Hebrew people did not read the scriptures like that. And most specifically, they did not read the Psalms that way. A Psalm was one whole thought. It was a Psalm. And so you would never take one verse out of the psalm and develop a doctrine by it. If you quote it in particularly the first verse of a psalm, you were declaring the entire psalm is what you would be doing. And so when the Pharisees were telling Jesus that he had been forsaken by God, Jesus quotes Psalm 22, which begins with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then do you know what it describes? Jesus on the cross. That's what it describes. And then you get down to verse 24, and Jesus is saying, He has not abhorred me in my affliction, neither is his face hid from me. But he hears me when I cry out to him. And then he cried out to God. So Jesus was telling them. You guys remember the first temptation of Jesus? What did he do to combat the temptation or the lie of the serpent? He quoted the word, didn't he? Okay, so he quoted the word the first time he was being tempted by Satan. Right? Use your ability. Turn those stones into bread. Feed yourself with life. Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of the Father. What was the word the Father just said to him before he went into the wilderness to be tempted? You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus said, man finds life by that word that has been spoken over him. Right? He quoted the word to combat the serpent. Well, there's Jesus on the cross again being tempted. And what are they tempting him with? Give yourself life. Come down off the cross, clothe yourself, prove you're the son of God. If that's what he said, isn't that what Satan said to Jesus in the first temptation? If you are the son of God, turn the stones into bread. Doesn't that sound like what the Pharisees said to Jesus? If you are the son of God, come down off the cross. And do you know how Jesus responded? The same way he responded in Luke chapter 4 in the wilderness. He quoted the word, and you know which word he quoted? Psalm 22. And do you know what he was telling them? You think God's forsaken me? You think I'm here all alone because the death is swirling around me? Go read Psalm 22. It's describing me right now. It's describing this whole scene right now. And you'll see that he has not abhorred the affliction of the afflicted one, that his face isn't hid from him, but he hears him when he cries out to him. That's just in the scriptures. I'm sorry. That's just what the scripture says. I mean, you got a big problem in Psalm 22 if you want to say that that's Jesus saying he was forsaken because he says the opposite in verse 24. You start to have a big problem. It goes on to talk about, he goes on to start rejoicing right after Psalm 24. He has not hid his face from him. And he goes on to start rejoicing how he's going to declare the goodness of God. If Jesus was forsaken by God, how did he end up raised from the dead? So the guy who walked around his whole ministry saying that he would die and be raised from the dead, he all of a sudden forgot he'd be raised from the dead? What about Psalm 16? You shall not suffer your holy one to see corruption, neither shall you leave his soul in hell. Did he all of a sudden forget that? You see, we misunderstand the scriptures because mankind thought we were forsaken by God. And God had to teach us that he was there with us so that we could cry out to him. Well, the only way God could teach us that is if someone could enter into our life, take our sin and our death upon themselves, and then we would judge them to be forsaken by God. And then we would see God come and claim them as his own. And that would blow up our idea that death and darkness is a sign we're forsaken by God. And we would start to see God with us in the midst of death and darkness. And then we would find the same song coming out of our heart that was in Jesus' heart, which is, Abba, into your hands I commit my life. It's like the Adam mind, right? Would it, would it, <laughs> I love Adam, man. God bless Adam, right? What did Adam say when God came to him and said, did you eat from that tree that I gave you? I told you not to eat from? Adam says, it's that woman you gave me. Do you see how he blamed the woman and he blamed God? Do you notice that? The carnal mind tries to justify itself. The carnal mind will always try to justify itself. And if you're trying to justify yourself, it will come at the cost of blaming someone else. Right? Well, do you know what Isaiah 53 comes and says about the cross? 
It says we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And then we esteemed him smitten and stricken by God. It says he carried our griefs and our sorrows. We rejected Jesus. Mankind rejected Jesus because Jesus was God. And mankind had turned their backs on God. And Jesus came into the earth. We hid our faces from him. He carried our griefs and our sorrows. We were filled with hatred and envy and gossip and backbiting. And we smote and struck him. And we put him up on a cross. And then we esteemed him smitten and stricken by God. We were Adam all over again. We blamed God for what we did to the king of glory. It pleased the Father for him to be bruised. Well, there it is. There it says. The Father bruised him. Well, that's not what it says. It says that it pleased the Father for him to be bruised. Well, that word bruised, that's not the first time that word's used in the Scriptures. Do you know the first time it's used in the Scriptures? Genesis 3. And do you know who's talking about the bruising in Genesis 3? God himself. And do you know who God's talking to? The serpent. And do you know what he says to the serpent? You will bruise the seed of woman, and he will crush your head. So God himself says that Satan's going to bruise Jesus. And then we teach for decades, centuries in the church, that God's the one that bruised him. Do you know who got it right to get that word mixed up in the gospel? Satan. Satan's the thief that steals, kills, and destroys. And do you know what he wants to convince us of? God's the one. Do you know why he wants to convince us God's the one? Because we'll never be able to give our lives over into his hands if we think God's the one. It's contrary to human design. It's contrary to the human heart. The human heart can never be put to rest in the presence of someone that they think possesses the ability to do that to them. And he wants to give birth to his life in us. Right? And what was his life? If you read in Ezekiel, it says he reject, rejected the river from where he got life. And it says that he looked at the multitude or the beauty of his own branches. And he said, by the multitude of the merchandise I can gather to myself, I'll be exalted unto life. He wants to give birth to that in us. Where we're walking around living, trying to gather life unto ourselves. But he can never work that in us unless we judge God to be unfaithful. Right? Do you know why it pleased God for Jesus to be bruised? Do you know what they were doing? He tells us in Genesis 3 why it pleased him for Jesus to be bruised. Because Jesus was crushing the head of the serpent. He was destroying him who had the power over his people through death. And so Jesus was being bruised by the serpent and the serpent's system of sin and death. And he was taking it into his own body. And the father knew that Jesus was now going to take back the keys of Hades and take back and give the keys of David to mankind. We've been given the keys to heaven. Well, how did he get the keys? He first kicked open the gates of hell. How did he kick open the gates of hell? Death couldn't hold him. And so that's why it pleased the Father for Jesus to be bruised. He knew that Jesus was liberating us. I argued with God about this for like a decade. And I, no, the, the scripture says. <laughs> you think I'm joking. No, no, I, I tell God. He's my friend. Like I said, he's the most tangible person in my life. No, 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 that verse. And he systematically unwound all my... All my, what do I want to say? I thought I knew something. Any of you ever think you know something? Well, you're in big trouble if you think you know something. Because there's one person who knows. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The beginning of wisdom is to revere God. The beginning of wisdom is to say, there's nobody who knows. There's one rabbi. It's God. And then what happens is, is you lay down all your own conclusions. And then you can start to be taught of the Lord. Right? And then the scriptures start being opened up to you. And you start to see it accurately. Right? And then you're no longer trying to trust God. Now you have a new heart. Right? As soon as God comes and plucks out the idea that he forsook you, as soon as he plucks out the idea that he forsook Jesus, it heals your blindness. And you begin to see, oh my gosh. Because if you think the darkness at the cross was a sign that God wasn't there with the sun, do you know subconsciously every time you encounter darkness, you're also going to judge that God's not there. 
You don't even have to try not to. That's the subconscious effect of thinking the father forsook the son. Well, who does he represent? He represents me. And I'm supposed to find the testimony of my life in Jesus. But now I see that Jesus, I think he was forsaken by God. Well, what do you think that tells me about me? And we tried to trick ourselves. Well, no, no, no. He won't forsake us because he forsook Jesus. That's what I told God when he started telling me that. He's all, Greg, do you really think that makes sense in the human heart? He said, let's, let's look at it like this. You have an older brother. Let's say your older brother's perfect. Let's say he doesn't do anything wrong ever. And your dad comes to you and says, Greg, I want to teach you that I'll never forsake you. I want to teach you that I'll never leave you. And the way I'm going to teach you is I'm going to forsake your older brother that's perfect. Do you think that has the power to convince me he'll never forsake me? Do you know what would have the power to convince me he'll never forsake me? If I see he didn't forsake the one who represents me. Whose sin and death did Jesus have? Mine, right? And so I need to see that he won't forsake the guy who has my sin and my death because that begins to tell me that he won't forsake me. Right? Then trusting God becomes easy. Right? Now you see it's God that bruised death. Now you see Jesus bruising death. That's one of the most insidious things that can happen in your life is to separate the Father and the Son at the cross. I don't know how we think about it. Can God be God without the Son? Who is it that's holding all of the world together? Isn't it the Word? So all of a sudden, the word wasn't God? Who's holding everything together? And where's God during that time? Are we saying God was dead? Are we saying God didn't exist? Because you can't have God without Father, Son, and Spirit. Well, now all of a sudden, we've taught a theology that separates the Son from the Godhead? And we don't think that's a problem? I promise you, it is a problem. <laughs> And that's exactly what the serpent would want. Uh, I thought I had some water over there. Thank you. That's got nothing to do with what I wanted to talk about. Well, no, that's not true. It's got, it's got something to do. Go and twist on it, though. You should never disbelieve what somebody says to you. But go and pull up those verses and look what the Pharisees were saying to Jesus. Connect it to the previous temptation when Jesus quoted the word. And then recognize he was quoting the word. Also, then go read Psalm 22 and read the whole psalm and see what it says. Then go back and read Genesis and see how God himself said that the serpent would be the one that would bruise Jesus. This, this is a painful thing for me God had to do to me, right? Because I thought I knew something. I thought I'm a pretty smart guy. I'd studied the scriptures all my life, like a lot, right? If we're speaking as fools as Paul would say. I studied the scriptures as much as anyone, and I thought I knew something. You know what God told me? You don't get to decide what the scriptures mean, Greg. You don't, you don't get to decide who bruised Jesus. Because I said in Genesis 3. And I was like, okay. I felt like Job. What does it say about Job? What did Job say about God? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Right? Job looked at all the death that was happening. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Then in chapter 42, it says, God come down out of whirlwind and began questioning Job. Were you here then? Were you there then? And what does Job do? He repents. What did God say to Job? Who is it that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Who is it that paints me with darkness on me when they don't know what they're talking about? That was me. That was me. And it, listen, it's like the chastisement of the Lord. The chastisement of the Lord isn't that he'll punish you physically. The chastisement of the Lord is he comes to correct your heart with the good news. Because it's actually good news that God never forsook us, and it's good news that he never forsook Jesus. Because then it becomes easy to trust him. But then we fight with God about that. No, 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 no. Because we'd rather be right than be healed. <laughs> So many people's trauma, so many people's hurt, so many people's pain, so many people's strongholds. Do you know why they're there? It's not because God hasn't moved. It's because you're holding on to a bleep that cometh not from above. 
You're holding on to a wisdom that didn't come from the mouth of God. And more than likely, it's been presented to you as if it did come from the mouth of God. And now it's found a way to dwell in your heart and get deep down into your heart. And it's produced roots into your heart. And now it's producing a crop. And you're all the time thinking God hasn't done anything. God hasn't moved. God left you alone. He keeps coming to you trying to tell you that you're believing things about him and your life with him that come from the pit of hell. And that's why you find hell manifesting in your life. And he's trying to correct your heart with the good news. That's the chastisement of God, he comes and corrects you with the good news. In the letter to the Hebrews, do you know what the chastisement was? They were busy performing the sacrifices and the works of the law, trying to cleanse themselves from sin and death still. And the author of Hebrews come and said, God provided himself a lamb, and he cleansed you once for all time from sin and death. He has perfected you once for all time by the blood of his lamb. That's the chastisement. That's real painful, isn't it? Do you know why it was grievous for me when God first began correcting me about forsaken? Because you love the Lord, and it can hurt to find out you believe something about him like that for so long. And if you're really loving the Lord, and we use the word serve, I mean, you'll come to the place where you realize you're not really serving God in the sense our modern world describes it. God's serving you. I mean, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. They didn't wash his feet, right? Right? I mean, parents, you guys that have kids, who's serving who? Are you serving your kids or are they serving you? How many of you had kids so they could serve you? But that's how we describe God, right? And we never realize it. My parents are over 70. Guess what? They're still serving me. And it's not that I try to get them to do it. They're just doing it. Do you know why? They love my life more than their own. God loves your life more than his own. That's why he laid down his life for you. That's how he chastises you. You're busy trying to perfect yourself from the death in the world. You're busy trying to gather peace and love and joy to yourself. And he comes and shows you how he has given you everything that pertains to life and godliness in Jesus Christ. He comes and shows you how he's cleansed you once for all time from death. He comes and shows you how he has perfected you already by providing a lamb himself. Well, that corrects your heart when you're busy trying to perfect your own life. Right? That's chastisement. It will fit into what we want to talk about. Because I, I wanted to talk, let's just read this verse real quick and see what we can do. I can actually talk real fast, too. So I could, I could cram one hour into 20 minutes. It's a gift of the Spirit. I've been looking in the Bible for it. I haven't found it yet, but I know it's got to be somewhere. <laughs> it's like we can, we can jump outside of time for that hour, and I can get it all in, and then we can get back into time, right? And it'll be as if no time passed. Hallelujah. I mean, there's scriptures in the Old Testament where time stood still. Isn't it? Isn't it? We put God so much in a box. Um, let's see. Right. Um, man. I can't say enough about these guys as hospitality. Do all y'all know these two right here? Brian and Roisin? They're going to turn red as I point them out. Man, their hospitality knows no bounds. I just can't say enough about how wonderful they are and how great they have been to me and what a blessing it has been to be in their house. I'm going to miss you guys. I really am. Um, but I just want to talk about, uh, I want to start with this lovely verse about the heart. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10 says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Right? Now listen, for so long I would read that verse, and you know what I thought God was after with me? Like we talk about the will of God for our lives, don't we? Do you know what I, th I thought God's will for my life was? That I could be an obedient little boy. And, well, that, that, you could find some semblance of truth in that, but you'd have to really explain that and qualify that statement, right? Because I defined obedience in a way that the Scriptures didn't define obedience. I defined obedience as I got to behave properly all the time. And so I thought what God wanted for me more than anything in the whole world was for me to behave right. And if I could just behave right, then God would be very happy with me, Right? And then I would read verses like he'll write his law 
in my heart. And I would interpret that to mean he's going to bring forth things in me. Well, I'll behave perfectly all of the time because that's what he wants for my life. Do you know the law God writes in our hearts there is not talking about thou shalt and thou shalt not. And if that's what you're thinking, then you're not understanding what the scripture talks about. Do you know what the law God is talking about is? He's trying to bring something forth in our hearts where we cry out, Abba. He's trying to bring something forth in our hearts where we have one God, the Lord our God, and we don't look to our own strength when we need things like peace and love and joy and rest. That's what he's trying to bring forth in us. He's trying to bring something forth in us where we could live as little children. He's trying to bring something forth in us where we become fully persuaded that he's father and we're put to rest by his love for us, which is what was born in Jesus, right? Jesus was put to rest by the father's love for him. Jesus even defined, he said, I, even as I followed the father's commandment, I abided in his love, he said, right? And so God is after so much more with your life than you obeying orders. That's not what his goal is with your life. He's not trying to get you to obey orders. He could have made robots if all he wanted was for you to obey orders. And you could have been like a program, like a, a software program. And the program just made you obey orders all the time if that was, is what God was after with you. But he's after so much more with you. He's after intimacy with you. He's after closeness with you. He's after a romance with you. He's after something with you where you're able to give yourself fully over into his arms. And not because he told you you're supposed to, but because you find yourself so enamored by his integrity towards your life, you find yourself so so touched by his faithfulness towards you that you just find something in you where you want to give your life over into his arms. That's what he's after with you. And so everything he writes on your heart is with the intent that you would let him be your God. God wants more than anything to be your God. That's what he wants. But we've come and described what it means for God to be God in a pagan way. And so then we don't even think of what it means to be God. What it means to be God, what it means that he wants to be your God and he wants you to be his people, is that he wants to be the one that serves you with life. He doesn't want you left trying to find life for yourself. He doesn't want you left in the place where you're trying to protect and preserve your own life. He wants to come and protect and preserve your life for you. He wants to be God. You see, because the pagan gods demand things from their people. But this God doesn't demand, this God pours himself out. When God feels the best, when he feels most like himself, is when people are letting him empty himself for them. And this is what the law he writes in our hearts is about. And if you keep reading in Hebrews 8, that's exactly what it says. And I will be their God and they will be my people. What does he say in the Old Testament with the Israelites? He says, I'm going to bring you into a land. It's going to be a land that you didn't build any of the buildings. You didn't make any of the houses. You didn't plant any of the vineyards. And you didn't keep yourself from any of the enemies around you. It's going to be a land I give you that flows with milk and honey. And he comes and gives them a word to teach them that they didn't have the land by the strength in their own hand. He comes and gives them a word to teach them that everything they had in the land came from strength of his hand. This is what the law is that he's trying to write on your heart. You know, in the Hebrew, that word law, we, we, I, talk, I tell people this all the time. It's called the dictionary of your heart. Y'all have a dictionary in your heart. You're all grown people. Do you know what that means? You already have a whole lot of meanings for what these words mean by the time I come and speak them. You've already decided what the word law means. The second I said law, I didn't have to tell you what the definition was, did I? Every single one of you already had a thought. Well, guess what the word law in Hebrews means? It means teaching and instruction. Teaching and instruction. Do you know that word law in the Hebrew is Torah? Torah in the Hebrew. I don't know how much you guys know about the Hebrew language, but an interesting thing about the Hebrew language is each individual letter also comes with a picture for each individual letter. So you can get like a definition of the the word like we would think of it, but then you could also get a meaning of the word by looking at the pictures and putting the pictures next to themselves. Do you know what the word law in Hebrew that is Torah? When you look at the picture meaning, do you know what the pictures say? Behold the man on the cross. Do you know what God's trying to teach you about? The man on the cross. Do you know why he's trying to teach you about the man on the cross? 
Because if you can understand what it means that God provided himself as a lamb so that he could pour out of himself his life onto you, you'll find yourself giving your life over into his arms because you'll be persuaded. He loves me. He really loves me. You won't be like the person with the flower petal. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. Do y'all have that over here? I don't know if that's a cartoon or something. You remember that? You're picking the, he loves me, he loves me. That's how we feel, isn't it? We walk through this world, things go good, he loves me. Things go bad. We, is this a trick question? If we're being, intellectually, we would still say, I know he loves me. But if we're being honest, there's times where we felt confused, right? And we feel confused by what we see. Will God come to show us this? I've loved you with an everlasting love. While you were dead in sin, I came into the earth and offered myself for your sin so that I could take your death into myself and I could heal you from your sicknesses and your diseases so that I could heal you from the sickness of death that sin was serving you with. And if you could see me, that's what a God would do. In fact, if you're actually the God of a people and the people you are a God of were dying and were dead in sin, the only way you could claim to be their God is if you showed up yourself and took their sin and death into yourself and conquered it, you would be their God. And that's how you would demonstrate that you were their God. You would come to them in the midst of being dead in sin. And you wouldn't come to them as the thief that steals, kills, and destroys. But you'd come as the good Samaritan. That when you found your people left for dead on the side of the road, you'd pick them up. You'd fill them with the wine of your life. You'd make a place for them to dwell in your house for all eternity. God's the good Samaritan. He's not the thief. And when he comes and shows us that, all of a sudden we start believing this guy meets the qualifications to be our God. The human heart is fickle. You ain't just going to trust everybody. We'll just do an experiment. Let's say I come to you after the meeting and ask to borrow your car for a week. How many of you are going to give me your car for a week? Just be honest. You might like me. You might think this guy's a man. You might even think he's a man of God. But in your head, you're going to start thinking, I don't know if I can trust him with my car. What if he wrecks it? Does he have an insurance? I mean, what, what? I mean... We struggle. We're, we're, our heart is fickle. We struggle to trust. We can't just trust anyone with our heart, in fact. In fact, it's impossible for us to just trust anyone with our heart. We require evidence. We require proof that they're trustworthy. We require evidence that they won't harm our lives. We require evidence that they possess the ability to give our lives the care that they need. We require evidence that they love our lives more than their own life. We require evidence that they would rather lay down their life for us than have us die. That's the kind of evidence we need to trust. Well, God knows that about the human heart. He's the one who made the human heart. He knows what our hearts are doing. You know, our hearts are like in an interview process. How many of you have applied for a job before? I used to have to do a lot of interviews when I worked at the finance company. And I would get lots of applications. Right? And there's a certain skill set, qualification for the position. You wouldn't just hire anyone. You couldn't just trust anyone to do the job. You had to see their application. And looking at their application, you would have to think, okay, they have the proper skill set. Right? They have the ability to perform the task. And that, w- that still wouldn't be enough. That would just get them in the pile for an interview. You're still going to scrutinize them because you're not sure if you can trust them to do the job. You're not sure if they can. Well, it's on paper there, but I need to see them face to face. I need to see it in the flesh. I need to see it in person. And then you'd have them in there for a job interview. And you're scrutinizing them all over again, asking them hard questions, trying to back them into a corner, trying to see if they actually can perform the job, if they actually have the qualifications and the skill set to perform the job. And if they can do all that, then your heart starts to feel, okay, I can hire them. They have the qualifications. That's what our hearts do with God. That's what our hearts do when we're looking for someone that can be our God. We have to know that they meet the qualifications. Our heart has to know that they can be trusted with our life. How many of you think your life is precious to you? We know it's precious to you, otherwise you wouldn't care if anything ever bad happened. So your life is precious to you. You think you're just going to give it over into anyone's arms? No, you have to see that there's good evidence why you're going to do that. And so God knows our hearts are doing this. He knows that our hearts are like 
critiquing him and grilling him and trying to be persuaded that he's trustworthy. And the final interview for God is when he comes and lays down his own life for ours. Right in our presence. Right in our midst. And he doesn't just lay down his life for ours, which starts to tell you he loves your life more than his own. That's one of the first qualifications to trust somebody. Right? I mean, I didn't get my wife to give herself over into my arms by showing her I wasn't trustworthy. That's what we call courting. Right? I mean, what are you doing when you court a woman? Guys? What are you trying to convince the woman of? That she can trust you with her life. You're trying to convince her that you don't have the ability to do her harm. You're trying to convince her that her life is precious to you and that you love her life more than your own. You're trying to convince her that you don't want anything from her, but you want to give her everything, right? Well, that's what God was doing with us because our maker is our husband. Right? He wants to be the one that brings forth fruit in us. He wants to have intimacy with us. He wants to have closeness with us. But he can't have what he wants from us unless we're persuaded that it's safe to give our lives over into his arms. And so that's what the law God writes on our hearts is. It's about him wooing our hearts. It's about him romancing our stony hearts. Right? You guys seen that movie, Romancing the Stone? That was a long time ago. You guys are thinking, oh, you look, you're older than you look. <laughs> you're like, no, you, you, you look as old as you are. <laughs> the, the hair gives it away, right? He's trying to convince you. That's what he writes on our hearts. He's trying to convince you he'll only be good to you, that he that doesn't possess the ability to do harm to you. He's trying to convince you of who and what he is so that you don't have to try to trust him but it calls forth trust in you. Just like God said, let there be light. Remember how God said, let there be light and light was? God is saying in the earth, let there be trust, right? And he's trying to call forth trust out of your heart. And the way that he does it is he comes and lays down his life for your life. He, pray, he prefers your life over his own. So he prepares himself a body so he can take the death that's tormenting you into himself and he can justify you with his life. That's the new heart. Ezekiel 36, 23 says, And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen. This is God talking. He says, I will sanctify my name that was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Do you see how he says he'll be sanctified? By revealing his goodness towards them, by gathering them from being scattered, by gathering them from their exile and bringing them together and bringing them into their own land. His name will be sanctified because his name had been blasphemed in the earth. Do you know how his name had been blasphemed in the earth? All the people blamed him for what happened to Israel. Israel went a-whoring after other gods. And those other gods left them being destroyed because those other gods aren't gods at all, and they don't have life to give. And the moment they worshiped the works of their own hands, they went off into destruction. And all the nations around them started blaming God for the destruction that came upon Israel. And God comes and says, I will sanctify my great name in your midst. The way I'm going to sanctify it is I'm going to come and prove my goodness towards you and my faithfulness towards you by bringing you out of the miry clay. And when I come and bring you out of the miry clay and bring you into a land that's flowing with milk and honey, then all the nations around you will see that I'm not the God that punishes. I'm not the God that destroys. I'm not the God that accuses. I'm not that God that steals. I'm actually the God that justifies the ungodly. I'm the God that heals the sinner. I'm the God that defends the sinners against the accusation of the evil one. I'm the God that causes sinners to overcome the devil. And then you know what will happen when they see that about you? 
They'll have a new heart, even a new spirit. And you know what that new heart will be? They'll begin calling upon my name also because they'll see that I don't destroy. They'll see I heal. They see that I don't accuse. They'll see I justify. They'll see that I don't condemn. They'll see that I come and stand in your defense. And then they'll see that I can be their God also because the interview process going on in their hearts is scrutinizing me to see if I really am God. And now I come and prove I'm God because I conquered death in the flesh. The death that was killing my people, they needed someone who could conquer death. And they didn't know that they had someone that could be their God. And then I showed up and conquered death inside of their body, declaring to them all, I am the God they need. I am Father. I am as I ought to be as Father. Only a father would lay down his life for his children. And you want to know what and who I am? I am God. And he proved it by taking your death into himself and then taking vengeance on death in the body of Jesus' resurrection. And that's how he comes and gives you a new heart. And your song is no more, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the song that starts coming out of your heart is Abba. And now you're no longer living with the burden of caring for your own life. You've been made as a little child again because you see that he is as he ought to be his father. And he will be the father of your life and he will father his life in you. We, we've blasphemed the name of God in the earth. The body of Christ. And we didn't do it on purpose. But we ought to come together and realize that we have done that. Judgment must first come to the house of the Lord, Peter said. And that doesn't mean condemnation. Judgment just means a decree. It means to issue a word. And the church is supposed to be in the earth declaring the God that rather take death into himself than let sinners die. But we've been declaring a God that forsakes sinners. We've been describing God in the image of the serpent. It's the serpent that steals, kills, and destroys. Not God. Do you know who said that? Jesus. Do you know what all the people thought when Jesus said that? that God demanded for the woman in adultery to be stoned. But there's a problem. Jesus is God. And there he was standing there next to the woman caught in the act of adultery. Moses says she should be stoned. I know you guys think Moses says she should be stoned, but I'm God. I wrote the law with my finger. And so what does Jesus do? He's God. Did Jesus stone her? No. What did he do? He removed the accusation. He removed the sentence of death that was hanging over her head. He justified her from the accusation. What did he say? Woman, where are your accusers? They're not here. Neither do I condemn you. He's God. He was sanctifying the name of God. And do you know where he was when he did that? The temple. He was trying to sanctify the name of God in the temple. Do you know what you are? You're the temple of God. Do you know what the gospel comes to do? It comes to sanctify the name of God in your heart. It comes to make clean the image of God in your heart because Satan got death planted in the earth. And that death began marring the image of God in your heart. And it began convincing you things about God that weren't true. And it made it impossible for you to live as a little child. It made you impossible to trust God with your life. It made it impossible for you to give your life over into his arms. You want it to. You came every week singing songs, asking God to heal you, asking God to save you, asking God to help you be free. You wanted to trust him all the while his image had been marred in your heart. And you weren't really knowing him as the Abba of Jesus Christ, but you were knowing him more like the image of the serpent that steals, kills, and destroys. Moses never said that God kills sinners. Moses said the wages of trusting in your own strength for life is death. That's what Moses said. You know what else Moses said? The wages of trusting in your works for life is death, but God will preside himself a lamb to heal you from death. There's Jesus sanctifying the name of God in the temple. You've heard it said, but I say. He's giving us a new heart, right? He's romancing us. He's romancing our stony heart. That's what a stony heart is. Right? The, the scriptures talk about an evil heart of unbelief. An evil heart of unbelief. Do you know what that word evil means in the Greek and the Hebrew? It means a heart filled with labor and annoyances. Do you know why your heart would be filled with labors and annoyances? 
If you don't know, you have a good father who doth work. If you don't know, the father's with you to work, to preserve your life and serve you with life. You'll be filled with labors and annoyances. That's why it's called an evil heart of unbelief. Do you know what Jesus describes unbelief as in the Gospel of John, just a few chapters after he delivered the woman caught in the act of adultery? He described unbelief as not believing in the goodness of God. Do you know when he told the woman, go and sin no more? Do you know the sin he was talking about? He was talking about not, go, not living like an orphan anymore as if you don't have a good father with you to care for your life. That's what he was talking about. The woman, do you know the, the act of adultery? The whole Old Testament is about Israel having committed adultery on God. It wasn't talking about physical adultery. It's talking about fornicating with your own strength and your own works. You have intimacy with your own hand trying to produce the fruit of God's life. Do you know why you do that? Because you think you're an orphan. You think you don't have a father that will protect you and give you life. So now you're trying to give it to yourself. That's what the woman caught in the act of adultery was doing. The reason she was doing that is because she was trying to gather life to herself. She didn't know she had a good father that would care for her life. Well, Jesus manifested the good father right there in her presence, and he showed her that he can be the God that she needs. He showed her that he can be the father that she needs. Emmanuel, everlasting father, prince of peace, mighty God. There's Jesus showing, I can be the God that you need. You think your life is suffering harm? You think you have to protect and preserve your own life? You think you have to gather life to yourself? Well, here I am. I'm not the thief that steals, kills, and destroys. When I am come, I come to give you an abundant life. And when you look in the Greek, do you know what it means, an abundant life? It's a life that superabounds. You know what it superabounds over? The death in this world, the lack in this world. I have come to give you a life that will lift you up over the tribulation and the death in this world. That's the unbelief, he says. When he says, go and sin no more, go and no longer live as if you're an orphan needing to carry the burden of your own life. Go and know that the Father is filled with integrity towards your life. The Father is with you to serve you with life. Go and no longer live carrying the burden of your own life. Go and live as a little child. That's what he was saying. That's what he's teaching. That's the new heart, right? It also talks about an evil conscience, a wicked conscience. Do you know what an evil conscience and a wicked conscience is? It's a conscience that's filled with its own working to have life because it doesn't see the Father there working. You're blind. You don't see God with you. And in that example with the woman caught in the act of adultery, you know what Jesus did right after that? He healed the blind dude. <laughs> he healed the blind guy right after that. An evil conscience is a conscience filled with labors and annoyances. Adam's conscience was evil when he was trying to clothe himself. Do you know why? He couldn't comprehend God there with him to clothe him. He didn't see God with clothe him, so he was trying to clothe himself. That's an evil conscience. That's an evil heart of unbelief. That's the same meaning of the word wicked. It's not that the people are wicked like we think of people being wicked. It's that their conscience is wicked. Their heart has become filled with labors and annoyances. That's what it means to be wicked. Well, you know how you'd heal somebody that's wicked then? Show them the goodness of the Father. You know how you'd bring about repentance in someone? Do you know what repentance even is? We think repentance is you're doing bad things and now you need to stop doing those bad things. That's not what repentance is. Repentance is for your mind to be turned from trusting in your own self for life and to be turned towards trusting in the Father for life. Right? Because the works, Paul called them the works of the flesh. You can't repent, repent from the fruit that comes forth from the flesh. You repent from trusting in your flesh for life and then the works of the flesh will go away. Right? And the way God causes you to no longer trust in the strength of your hand for life is He comes and shows you the strength of His right hand, the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes and flexes out. We say in the States, take me to the gun show. The guns. God showed us His guns. My right arm is more than enough to serve you with life. Well, you were busy trying to give yourself life. Well, all of a sudden, that will bring forth a repentance where you stop trusting in your own strength and you begin seeing the strength of God, right? That's repentance. That's what you minister to the wicked. They're living as if they're an orphan. Don't we say it all the time? It's the orphan spirit. 
And do you know how you cause an orphan to no longer live as an orphan? You show them they have a father. You show them they have an inheritance. You show them they're not alone in the world. That's how they get a new heart. Right? You guys following me? I know I get excitable, but... In my relationship with my wife, and I'll finish with this example, I could say a lot of things, but I'm, you guys are gracious, and you've let me talk so much. And I know it's hot in here, because I'm hot, more hot than everyone. <laughs> in my relationship with my wife, we talked about life can happen to us, right? Well, I mean, I'm married, and so when life happens to me, it can happen to my wife and me at the same time, right? And when things go awry in our lives, you know, my wife can sometimes misunderstand what's happened as I can also, but we'll use it for me to her in this example. And there's times where she could be confused about the intent in my heart because something can go wrong. She can have her feelings hurt, and she could think that my intention was to hurt her. Or she could be confronted with the thought that maybe I'm looking out for myself and not looking out for her. She could be confronted with the thought that I care more about myself than I care about her or that I don't care. Do you know what happens when, that, when those situations happen? She can give me a look, right? <laughs> you know what else will start to happen? She can harden her heart to me. Do you know why she hardens her heart to me? Because all of a sudden, she's wondering what my intentions are towards her. All of a sudden, she's wondering, does this guy really love me more than he loves himself? Well, how could this happen? How could this be? It sounded like he said this. It sounded like he did this. I needed him more than ever in this moment, and then he wasn't there. Right? Why wasn't he here for me? Where was he? Does he really love me? Does he really care about me? What happened? And then all of a sudden, before she even knows it, she don't have to try it hard in her heart. Her heart will become hard because she'll start thinking she can't trust me with her life. She'll start wondering if she could trust me with her life. She'll start thinking she has to trust, carry the burden of her own life. I have to protect myself. And she'll start hardening her heart, right? That's the same thing we did with God. Things went wrong in the earth. And we thought, well, does he really love us? How could this happen? Does he care about me more than he cares about himself? Well, how could I be here then? And where was he? I needed him. Why wasn't he there? And we could start having misunderstandings. And we, we, that's where the hard heart towards God comes. Well, you know, when my wife starts feeling that way about me, you know what I might do? I might go get her some flowers. Now listen, when I get her flowers, I'm not trying to be penitent. I'm not even trying to take the blame onto myself. Who cares about that? When I tell my wife sorry, listen, man, all I care about is this woman knowing what's really in my heart for her. It's not a fight about who's right and who's wrong. Married couples spend too much time fighting about who's right and who's wrong. Who cares? The only thing that matters is that the person on the other side understands your heart is pure towards them. So who cares who's right and wrong? I just want this woman to know that the only thought and intention in my heart is to be good to her. And if a sorry's going to do it, well, glory to God, man. I'd gladly lay down my life then. So what's it matter if I have to be concede the point? <laughs> We get so prideful in our sorries. So I might go get her flowers, but it's not like an admission of guilt to me. I'm not even trying to be penitent. Do you know the only thing I'm thinking? Something has come against this woman's heart that I love. And it's trying to tell her that I'm not for her as much as I am. And she's starting to feel, she's starting to get hard. And I don't want her to have a hard heart because I want, to give, I want her to give herself over into my arms. And I want to be able to give myself over into her arms. And so I'm going to go get flowers for her. You know what I'm going to get flowers for her? To give her a new heart. A heart of flesh, like Ezekiel says. Flesh is soft. It's not stony. Because I want her to let me in. I want her to let me into her heart. I want her to think she doesn't have to protect herself from me. I want her to know there's no guile in me. That there's no harm in me. That the only thing there is in me for her is love. And that I'd rather die than let harm come to her. Right? Well, that's what God did. He kind of went and got us flowers. Because all the death happened, all the trauma happened in our lives, and we become very confused. We thought he loved us. We really did. But then these things start happening. And they're compelling things sometimes. Some bad things can happen. And you can feel really, you can feel like that's compelling evidence. And you can start to wonder, 
Can I really trust him? Is he really there for me? Does he really care? You can even get to the place where you say, well, he loves me, but he just doesn't care as much about my life as these things, as I do. And then you don't even realize it, but your heart's growing hard towards God. And you don't even realize it, but you're building up walls. You don't even realize it, but you're no longer crying out to him when you need peace and love and joy. You're trying to serve it to yourself. You don't even realize it, but you're carrying a heavy burden up for your own life. And you don't even realize it. Well, God goes to get us flowers, except the flowers he goes and gets us is he comes into the earth and he takes the death that's tormenting us into himself. And then he bullies the death in the body of Jesus' resurrection. He bullies the bully that was bullying us. And he does it right in our midst. That's him bringing us flowers. And, you know, he looks at us with a tear in his eye. I know you thought that I wasn't there for you. I know you thought that I didn't care. I know you think that I don't love you. I know this world is trying to tell you that every day. I know. I know. And it makes sense to me that you could feel this way. So I'm going to come and do this right in your midst so that you could know the love that I have loved you with is an everlasting love. And so that you could know that I'd rather take your death into myself than let anything happen to you. And you could know that I gave up my body to be broken so the life I have in myself could be poured out on you. And that life could keep you from the destruction in this world. And then you have a new heart. And it starts tearing down the walls in your heart. And you start to feel safe in his presence. And you start to know he can never harm you. That there's no, no darkness in him. There's no death in God. John comes and says it this way. There's nothing to be afraid of in God. He says there's no fear in God. He says there's no fear in God. Do you know what that means? If you're actually looking at God properly, you wouldn't be able to find anything in him that would make you afraid of him. That's what he's trying to persuade you of. The easiest way is for him to come and let himself be nailed to a cross to heal you. <laughs> Right? And then that becomes the evidence. That's the new heart. It's a soft heart now. He softened your heart. Now your, your walls come down and you're giving yourself over into his arms. And now you're always crying out, Abba, Abba. Now you're living as a little child again. Right? Because he wrote his law on your heart. Right? He wrote the teaching and instruction that he came into the earth and provided himself as a lamb onto your heart to perfect you once and for all from everything that hurts you. He comes and writes that on your heart. And then you know, he loves me. He really loves me. Right? Does that make sense? You all track with that? We'll just pray. Father, you're the lover of our lives. We just thank you, Lord, that you don't mind romancing us, that you don't mind chasing after us, that you don't mind pursuing us. I just thank you, Lord, that you're in us and that you're working every day to show us that you're trustworthy, that you're working every day to show us that you're not the condemner, that you're not the punisher, that you're not the destroyer, that you're not the thief. I thank you, Father, that everybody in this room can get a revelation of your goodness towards them, that they can get a revelation that even when you find them dead in sin, that you're working to justify them, that you're working to stand in their defense, to remove the accusation, that you're working to exalt them, to pick them up out of the miry clay. I just thank you, Father, that there are, there's a, a song that starts coming forth out of people's hearts, and that song is Abba. Into your hands I commit my life. I thank you, Father, that the people in this room will start bearing much fruit. And they're not bear fruit by their own doing, but they begin to bear the fruit that comes forth by your hand because they have given themselves over into your arms. I just thank you, Father, that the Spirit work in all these people's hearts and bring something forth in them where they give their lives fully over into your arms, where they feel safe, where they feel okay to be vulnerable with you, where they feel okay to just bear their heart in your presence, Lord, and to plop their heart out in your presence, knowing that you'll heal their heart, that you'll put a balm on their heart, that you'll heal their heart from the sting of death. Thank you, Father, for your love for us. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus.